TMZ TV. There may be a lot of things that might uh, appear to you at first glance to be unnecessary details in the scripture. Like, why does Paul share his itinerary with the Romans? Who cares where he's going next? Is it important to know that he wants to go to Spain? Well, apparently it is. Because God purified these words seven times and he wants us to know them. So I'm going to delve into the minutiae today about Paul's itinerary, which he shares with the Romans. Why does he do it? It gives a human side of Paul. <clears throat> we think of him as a saint in stained glass. And it helps us to know that this man of God, this great man of God, who Jesus Christ entrusted with the evangel of the transcendent grace of God, was a human being with normal human feelings, human expectations, human needs. He needed to be seen. He needed to see the saints. And he needed to be with them. And this is so comforting. And it's touching, really. So here we go. Paul shares his itinerary with the Romans. This is in chapter 15, verses 23 through 29. But in the concordant version, verse 23 and 24, for instance, are practically unreadable. Now, it seems like I'm criticizing the concordant version. Uh, no, not really. But it's just so literal that in some places it's practically unreadable. Let me share verse 23. Let me share verses 23 and 24 with you. Yet now... Yet now, having by no means still place in these regions, yet having for many years a longing to come to you as ever, I may be going into Spain, for I am expecting, while going through, to gaze upon you and by you to be sent forward there, if I should ever first be filled in part by you. All right, now, if anybody knows what that means, I propose a toast to you. Now, I'm going to read the entire passage that is Romans 15, 23 through 29. Now, let's just do 23 and 24 from the message. Eugene Peterson's concoction. Uh, the message is mostly questionable, sometimes despicable, but occasionally helpful. It's a paraphrase. So here's how Eugene Peterson starts with verse 22, goes on to verse 24. Paul speaking, and that's why it has taken me so long to finally get around to coming to you. But now that there is no more pioneering work to be done in these parts, and since I have looked forward to seeing you for many years, I'm planning my visit. I'm headed for Spain, and I expect to stop off on the way to enjoy a good visit with you and eventually have you send me off with God's blessing. Oi, isn't that beautiful? I think it's positively lovely. So, this is my, these are my comments on that. Now, I think Peterson has helped us. But how am I supposed to comment on it? I mean, I would call this insipid detail. And such insipid detail hardly inspires elaboration. What am I supposed to do? One has to wonder why God, as I said at the beginning, even deemed it necessary to include Paul's humdrum itinerary. Uh, uh, what are you going to do next, Paul? Use the bathroom. But he found it necessary to include it in the scriptures. Now, were I to comment on the text itself, if I were to write a commentary on this, for instance, like the one I did, I would say this. It has taken Paul a while to finally get around to coming to the Romans, but now that he has no more pioneering work to be done in whatever parts he was in, and since he had looked forward to seeing the Romans for many years, Paul began planning his visit. He planned to head to Spain, expecting to stop off on the way to enjoy a good visit with the Romans and to eventually have the Romans send him off with God's blessing. Oh, that was beautiful. Pure, simple, and holy. But I know nobody asked me. That's okay. But I guess the point is that my commentary is precisely as dull as the text itself. And if you managed to stay awake up until this point in this video presentation, I'll tell you why I think God purified this account of Paul's travel plans like silver in a crucible and refined it like gold 
seven times. I'm referring, by the way, to Psalm 12, 6. And I will present this banality to you, like God did. God presented this banality to you, the modern reader, in the most precise, God-like manner possible. And here's why. Okay, the simple truth here that deserves recording is that the great apostle was not some high, mighty administrator ensconced in his ivory tower, enmeshed in his own literature, his heart removed from those to whom he ministered. No. Instead, rather, his heart yearned to see the Romans. And along this line, he spares no ink telling them about it. He goes on and on about it, really. They must know his feelings. This is what he's thinking to himself. They must know how much he loves them. And God must let us know that the possession of such pure and simple human emotions should bubble happily forth from us. No matter how proficient we are in the scriptures or how refined we are in spirit. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we do not at any time lose our humanity, as many accuse us of doing, when we look into the minute details and the great spiritual depths, heights, and breadths. Breadths, yeah, I'm going to pluralize that, breadths. Not many people do that. I'm a pioneer myself of the scripture. And I think uh, this is just me. Take it for what it's worth. I think Paul feels a little guilty. I think that he has not seen the Romans in so many years. I feel guilty so many times that I have not written people. I have not written to thank people. I have not stayed in touch with certain people who are sincere and gushingly loving me. And I, I feel bad about it. And so, Paul really feels the need to explain the delay. He feels like he owes them this explanation. Well, I, I think it's sweet. He doesn't want the saints of Rome thinking ill of him. He's like a normal person. You don't, want, you don't want people to think bad of you. I mean, if you have to make enemies, you have to, but you don't try to. You tell the truth and you will make enemies. Paul doesn't want to make enemy, enemies. I don't want to make enemies. But the delay is because of his work. But he doesn't want the Romans to think he's forgotten them. But he explains his work. I've been working. That's what Paul basically says. But now that the work is completed, quote, in these parts, Paul intends to visit the Roman Ecclesia on his way to Spain. I mean, you know, I know it's not ideal. He should just go to Rome to visit the Romans for themselves. But they just happen to be in the way of his going to Spain, so he's going to visit them. I don't think they took it badly. Maybe they did. I don't think so. Let's go on. Um, it's notable here that Paul would visit the Romans on the way to Spain. See, Spain is Paul's primary objective. Why? Because the gospel had not yet reached there. And Paul was all about reaching open hearts with the gospel, like people that had no baggage, people who were just primed by God to hear. And apparently those people were in Spain. Only secondarily, and the Romans might have felt bad about this, only secondarily would he like hang out with the Romans. Nothing against the Romans. But this does speak much of the Spaniards. It speaks well of the Spaniards, I must say that. And Paul doesn't even know the Spaniards. But what this does speak to really is Paul's dedication to his charge to bring the evangel to anyone who would listen. And the man traveled far and wide to do that. Here's verses 24 and 25 in the Concordant Version. A little better, I think. Listen to this. For I'm expecting while going through to gaze upon you. Love that phrase. Gaze upon you. And by you to be sent forward there if I should ever be filled in part by you. Okay, I take it back about this making sense. Yet now I'm going to Jerusalem dispensing to the saints. Okay, when Paul arrives in Rome, he plans to really 
darken whatever doorway would open to him first. Probably Priscilla and Aquila, I'm thinking. Like Romans 16, 3, he mentions Priscilla and Aquila. Loves those people. Great hosts, great guests. And he wants to gather with his eyes every human presence. Paul just wants to take in, like I did at the conference in South Carolina. I gathered with my eyes every human presence. I was hungry for it. Paul was the same way. He wants to, quote, gaze upon the Romans. Look what this says about him. This is how starved this man is for fellowship. Just like many of you. Just like me, really, because Manford went to Virginia. Where in Virginia did he go? Up north. I forget what town it is. But he's, he's up there. He's not going to be back for another week. I miss that guy. He's my best friend down here, Manfred Jones. But this guy starved for fellowship. Even before greeting them, and what does he want to greet them with? A holy kiss. Holy kiss. A sacred high five. I made that up. That's not in the scriptures. But the holy kiss is. But this guy wants to rubble in the mere materialization of other saints. He wants to appreciate how these flesh and blood believers, this sounds bad, but he wants to appreciate how they take up space. You know, where before, before he left for Spain, there was nothing worthily tangible between himself and a blank wall. I don't know. I mean, I'm staring at a blank wall every time I make these videos. No. Well, there's some wine, three wine bottles in this little thing against the wall. But I don't see you. I would love to see you, but I don't. But Paul had the same problem. We think of Paul oftentimes as a completely spiritual person. Oh, yeah, he's just like all about the truth. He's, he's coldly intellectual. We forget that the spirit and flesh exist concurrently. Our flesh, in some degree, is motivated by the spirit. Paul talks about Gazing upon. What does that involve? The eyes. We're not like the Gnostics. I can't stand those Gnostics. Are there any Gnostics still around? I don't know. But the Gnostic disposition is that matter is evil. Anything physical is evil. That's not true. Hugs are not evil. Kisses are not evil. Gazing upon familiar faces is the farthest thing. It's the farthest thing from an evil enterprise I can imagine. What could possibly be evil about Tryphena and Tryphosa, those hot twins in the Greek Ecclesia? What could possibly be evil about Tryphena and Tryphosa greeting you at the door with a holy hug and a bowl of pretzels? I mean, ah, I would love to have been in that Ecclesia. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Just me. Sorry. I'm telling you the truth. So Paul would then expect, he would expect heartwarming fellowship. That's what he wanted. Possibly. Probably. Spending a few nights lodging at one believer's home or another. Probably again, Priscilla and Aquila. I would be at the home of Tryphena and Tryphosa if they lived at the same place. If they were unmarried. Only if they were unmarried. Thank you very much. And I think that probably several of the saints in the Roman Ecclesia, and there were a few of them, you read of them in chapter 16 of Romans, would probably compete for the honor of lodging their teacher. Who wouldn't? Lodging their teacher for the night. It would be an honor. Honestly, it would. This was in the late 90s. Uh, so I remember visiting Dean Huff and Tony Nungesser in Almont, Michigan. Maybe it was 98, 97, 98. Uh, Dean and Tony, Dean Huff, the editor of the Unsearchable Riches magazine, Tony Nungesser, working for the Concordant Publishing Concern. At that time, they lived and worked, and I think they still do, in a home owned by Gertrude Venlet. I'm not sure who owned the home in the 1930s, but listen to this. It was someone of faith. I don't know who it was, but listen to this. Dean told me, Dean Huff told me, that the bedroom that I would occupy that night that I visited Almont, Michigan, had been occupied by A.E. Nock, 
on his way to Germany from Los Angeles in 1936. Uh, he went there to supervise the German translation of the Concordant Literal New Testament. So here's the question. Was I too spiritual to appreciate such a physical connection with a man whom I consider to be an apostle of Christ and a hero of faith? The guy who compiled the Concordant version? No. No. And I see no discrepancy between the physical and the spiritual, honestly. Maybe there are some in the body of Christ who would be the same. Maybe, uh, maybe there's some in the body of Christ who would be, who would feel the same way about me. I don't know, you know, lodging at their place. I don't know. After I've stayed at somebody's house, I don't know. Maybe they don't generally say Martin Zender stayed here. What they probably say is uh, Martin Zender raided our refrigerator, or Martin Zender ate all of our potato chips, or Martin Zender finished the box of Captain Crunch. That's generally what people say about me when I stay at their house. Yeah, I wish it was better, but it's not. That's how it is. So, let me say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop after this but i want to continue because this is so fascinating to me these minute commonplace physical things that are important to paul and they're important to us every time i go to a conference people are like paul was gazing upon everybody they're like sucking it in i love it because i don't know how the other speakers feel when i'm there up at the podium at a conference people are just sucking in my words it's so satisfying they can't wait to hear what i'm going to say it's like they take it in with this i want to say maniacal hunger but it's not maniacal it's controlled of course but it's a godly hunger for the truth and they they want to gaze upon me and when they they look at me they just devour me with their eyes and they say Ah, oh, and they give me a big hug. Like, I, I can't believe it's you, Martin Center. And they, they hug me and they greet me with a holy kiss. And I do the same to them because they tell me who their names are. And I say, oh, you're Scott Hirko or you're whoever. It's just so amazing to meet, to look at the face of someone that I've heard about because they comment on my videos, basically that, and I look at them. And it's just so satisfying to see that flesh and blood, that flesh and blood proof that this person exists. And then I tell them, and I mean it, I tell them, when I go back and I make another show, I'm going to see you now. I'm going to see you. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I see you. I know you. I know you're there. I know that all of you are there, and every single one of you I've met in the flesh, especially you, but everyone else. I know you're listening, and I feel your presence. And even though I'm staring at a blank wall right now, well, three bottles of wine over here, but I'm with you in spirit. And I need this. Many of you. Many of you tell me uh, we can't, we couldn't make it without your show. We just love the fellowship. We drink coffee, and my wife and I drink coffee and watch you in the morning. We send your show to our kids. I mean, it's just a miracle what God has done. And this is all beautiful. And what we're seeing in Romans, in this seemingly superfluous account of Paul's itinerary, what does it matter? God deigned to sanctify these words and to put them in the scripture for us to show Paul's physical need to be kissed with a holy kiss, to be hugged, and from his part, going toward the ecclesia, to gaze upon them. These are the inspired words of God, to gaze upon the Romans to see their faces. And you remember the time when the saints 
were seeing Paul off on some missionary journey and they hugged him and they wept. They basically got down on their knees and wrapped their arms around the guy. Such was their love for that man. And I feel that you have the same love for me. I know you do. I know you do. Because you've displayed it to me. And I, I can't live without it. And I have the same love for you. This is why we all go out of our way to go to a conference. There's a rumor of there being a conference. Winchester, Virginia. That's where Manford is. That's where Manford is. There's a rumor. The pirate, Mark Haukus, wanted to get a conference up in Virginia. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's already been too long since the South Carolina conference. Let's get an itinerary like Paul had. Let's connect the dots. How am I going to get from there, from here to Virginia? How are you going to get to Virginia? How are we going to plan it? Where are we going to be? What are we going to eat? Who's going to speak? These details are luscious. They're tactile. And we need this. This is why God inspired Paul to write about his itinerary. Seemingly the most boring part of Scripture. Who cares? Paul cares. God cares. I care. You care. And tomorrow, I want to finish talking about this. Because there's a little more from this passage that needs brought out. That needs expanded upon. That needs, that needs fleshed out. And again, I say, while our flesh has not been made immortal yet, we still have it, as I said yesterday. We're still saddled with it. We're saddled with the old humanity, even as we live in new humanity truth. But because we're still in these flesh buggies, we need some physical things. We need to eat. We need to drink. We need to sleep. And we need to see. When I said we need to drink, I didn't mean this. But then again, maybe I did. We need to see one another. And God saw the fellowship, and he said, it is good.